zooming in from or event writing in from. Uh, we have a fantastic panel this morning, but before we get to that, Shelly Porges, I'm the co-founder and managing partner of Beyond the Billion and the Billion Dollar Fund for Women, along with my co-founder, Sarah Chen. We're very excited to have you here this morning, share our story with you, and most importantly, share uh, insights into fintech defining the future, women at the forefront, which is what we're seeing today. Um, and, uh, you know, we... Uh, uh, some of you, a lot of you may know our story, but a few of you may not. And so for that purpose, I'd like to just start by not only thanking our sponsoring partner, MasterCard, a leader in supporting women innovators, which you'll hear more about from Liz Oaks, the Executive Vice President for Products and Innovation Strategy, but uh, also our other partners here that you can see on the screen. Uh, we appreciate everything you've done with us and for us. Uh, you know, it does take a village to do what we've done. And let me tell you what we've done. In October of 2018, Sarah and I launched a dollar fund for women as an initiative to catalyze capital for female founders. At the time, only 2.2% of capital, venture capital, was going to female founders. And even if you added in any company with even one woman founder on it, it was only another 10%, meaning that 88% of all venture capital was going to all male teams, largely all white male teams, I might add. And so our goal was to catalyze diversity, catalyze capital, to ensure that we had an inclusive innovation system and to ensure that uh, very uh, you know, great innovators who are very uh, worthy of the capital to scale their enterprises and to let us benefit from their innovations, um, you know, would, would have that chance. So um, in doing that, we, we were able to mobilize such partners as Mal Kier from Gobi Partners, and we're delighted to have you as one of the early, you know, early pledgers to our pledge and, and, and giving us a very big pledge as well. So we appreciate that and already fulfilled your pledge. So that's even more amazing. Um, uh, but anyway, we did that. We launched it in 2018. And in less than nine months, we were able to mobilize over a billion dollars of pledges from a global consortium of venture funds around the world. And today we have over 90 funds. We're well past the billion, which is why Sarah and I, one of the two reasons Sarah and I launched Beyond the Billion at the beginning of this year. Uh, Beyond the Billion is meant to do two things largely. Number one, uh, we recognize that you know, when people were asking us, what now, 2 billion, 10 billion, why cap it, right? Why not recognize that there's infinite talent, infinite innovation going on around the world uh, and many more innovators needing such capital. So therefore beyond the billion. But as importantly, we knew that to ensure that we had a sustainable uh, system, that it would go beyond a one-time pledge campaign, that we needed to draw in the LP investors into our effort. Uh, and that is what Beyond the Billion is largely about. It's about all the uh, mobilizations we're doing with LP investors now around the world. And this fall, you will be hearing a lot more from us about how we're doing that. And we've got uh, one of our great LPs, legendary Joanne Price. You're gonna hear more about her at Fairview Capital, her company that she co-founded over 20 years ago uh, in a little while. But um, you know that, that is what Beyond the Billion is. So without further ado, let me um, have uh, Sarah show you our video. Now, without further ado, 
let me turn my, uh, over the program to Sarah, who will be introducing our fantastic panel moderating today's discussion. Hey, thank you, Shelly, and hi, everyone. Coming to you live here from Washington, DC, I am so excited to have you all join us from across the globe for the very last billion dollar bite of this summer season. We started our series with MasterCard earlier this year, dealing with funding innovation in a time of crisis, and now wrap it up on a high with the rise of fintech. And I'm so thrilled to have with me a truly stellar planner. So let's dig in here. Joining us from London, Liz Oakes is Executive Vice President in Strategy and Operations Excellence for Product and Innovation at MasterCard. In this role, Liz is responsible for developing MasterCard's long-term strategy to deliver the best secure end user and customer experience around the world through co-innovation with clients, partnerships, and m and Welcome, Liz. From Shanghai, I have with me Lucy Yuetting Liu, co-founder and president of AirWallet, a global fintech transforming the way businesses move and manage money in their own markets and around the world. With a footprint of over 130 countries and over 50 currencies, Founded in Melbourne, Australia in 2015, AirWallex has grown from five founders and a foundation of FX Solutions to an international technology leader providing end-to-end -end financial services backed by world-leading investors, including those here today, MasterCard and Gobi Partners. Welcome, Lucy. And closer to me, uh, from Hartford, United States, I am thrilled to introduce Joanne Price. Joanne is co-founder and managing partner of Fairview Capital Partners an independent private equity investment firm with an aggregate fund cap of 9.6 billion. Since inception, founded in 1994, Fairview provides intelligent investment solutions and services for institutional investors managed through fund of funds, customized separate accounts, and other innovative structures. Fairview's areas of focus include venture capital, growth equity, small to mid market buyout, emerging managers, and frontier markets. Welcome, Joanne. And finally, we have from Singapore, Ku K. Mok. Mok is a partner of Gobi Partners, a leading venture capital firm in Asia with over 1.1 billion assets under management. He joined Gobi in 2010 and has invested in over 30 companies, including Carsum, Delivery, Echo, and Travilio. Prior to his career in Gobi, Mok was vice president in Bosnia Media and Media Corp of Singapore and was also part of the team that managed a 500 million fund at the Media Development Authority in Singapore. Welcome, Mark. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, our stellar panel, and it's time to dig into it. So after COVID-19 has held a grip on the world for most of this year, it's hard to not see everything through the lens of a pandemic in the industrial, technological, medical, educational, and financial world. As well in our personal lives, the pandemic has truly colored everything. Undeniably, one of the sectors most deeply and quickly affected was the fintech sphere. Suddenly left without access to a number of the traditional financial services that many were used to, people around the globe turned to fintech platforms en masse. Fintech platforms were relied upon to distribute loans, facilitate a large number of transactions that may have previously been conducted in cash, and many other things. So today, we discuss the rise of fintech with women at the forefront. We will examine the landscape first from a macro perspective and dive deeper into some of the unique challenges and opportunities within this vertical. So again, as I remind you, please, please send us your questions. We do want to hear from you. Type in the chat. We will be monitoring that and turning to you at the end of this session. So we'll have time to dig into there. And let me just say for this last session, whilst FinTech is the anchor of the session, we do want you to get the most from all the speakers here today who certainly have a varied experience. So feel free uh, to not limit yourself to only those questions within this topic. So let's get started here. Liz, if you would uh, please start us off. Innovation and disruption is incredibly beneficial to some. Undoubtedly, banks and larger financial institutions have been seen to be falling behind fintech companies, challenged by legacy systems and beyond. As the EVP responsible for developing MasterCard's long-term strategy for product and innovation, talk to us about how MasterCard is thinking about innovation and staying ahead of the game while balancing increasing requirements from open banking, PSV2, and more. What excites you about fintech and, and how are we moving forward here, Liz? 
Going back to your earlier comment also, Sarah, you know, the current circumstances we find ourselves in have accelerated, if anything, the focus that we have had in our innovation space. And, and that's really to uh, double down on innovation in things like digital first, contactless, enabling small businesses to be able to get paid and to pay in the current circumstances is actually a massive mobilization globally. This isn't just happening in the United States or in, you know, in the country that you're sitting in. All over the world, people are trying to figure out how to do things that previously were quite possible using cash or using uh, offline or paper modes. So actually for us, the du doubling down on that is really focusing on uh, in much more inclusive, much more relevant, much more thoughtful innovation in our local communities to start with. Um, I think previously, you know, we were all looking at uh, the incumbent players and the fintechs and wondering, are they helping each other? Are they competing? What's going to happen? I think the focus now, the healthy focus on what's going on in our own communities, how can we mobilize trade? How can we get our economies back on track is really going to drive a, a very particular focus in fintech. Great. Thanks, Liz. And Joanne, very early on, uh, Fairview made some early bets as an LP into funds such as Firstmark, Sierra, Venrock, that were all making some very big, bet, big bets on, you know, sort of data, open data, and also the infrastructure that backs, you know, B2B SaaS that backs a lot of the fintech that we use today. I mean, some of your, uh, I think, top hits from your portfolio companies are Shopify and Pinterest, to, to name a few. Uh, Joanne, can you comment on what Liz talked about here and, and how you see uh, fintech and, and sort of the industry evolving from an LP's point of view? And if you could please unmute yourself. That from a Fairview's perspective, and of course, we're looking at both uh, investment companies and we're looking at founders and we're looking at making sure that as we invest in the venture capital business, that we also want to make sure that we're bringing in next generation managers. And, and of course, since the uh, next generation managers were not primarily male uh, prior to, uh, to where we are today, we are looking to make sure that we have diversified our, our opportunity base and also the GPs uh, that, are, that are starting or who have gone into some, some of the firms that have been in business for many years. So I think I really we're proud to say that uh, we have been investing in um, firms that have either been founded by women or, in addition, uh, firms where women GPs have, have uh, entered and been, become a part of um, existing um, uh, firms that have already been in business. So they have been in the forefront in those cases of starting uh, fintech firms. So that's quite exciting. And, uh, and I think that, of course, is part of the Fairview story because our whole point uh, of starting Fairview was to expand the opportunity set in all ways. And of course that included um, making sure that women founders and GPs had an opportunity to really grow and be a major part of the business. Thanks, Joanne. And if I'm, I might dig a little bit deeper there, one of the, the other conversations that we've had actually on a bite before this with Lil Tony from Plaxo Capital was about exactly what you talked about, which is that women and people of color just have a differentiated lens. Do you find this to be the case and, and sort of also helped you in your selection, which resulted in sort of the, the good bets, right? That fintech is on the rise, that a lot of these industries that were nascent back in the day um, did materialize into uh, what would be some of your wins? Well, I think from a Fairview standpoint, and when you think of starting a firm and, and starting it at a time when this was not in, necessarily in vogue, uh, there has to be a belief system. And the belief system has to be that all people, given an equal opportunity, have the great, will be able to succeed and grow and develop uh, new companies, new businesses uh, in all ways. So we do have, and, and the nice thing at Fairview, we do have, after I did a little more research, uh, we have uh, three uh, female venture capitalists. One is a founder. Uh, another uh, was uh, Brewer Lane and one of the managing partners and also a battery and then uh, a crew capital. All of them have um, significant uh, fintech companies in their portfolio that they they are they started and are growing. So that is the whole point because in my own mind, 
if you have people who are doing the investing and they are um, females, and, and especially, and, and of course, diverse folks, they're also going to look for entrepreneurs who are um, female. And, and, and then also professionals who are going to be a part of, of, their, of their programs. They're going to be looking uh, for females. And so that's very important. And if, you don't, and if you don't have females in the mix from the beginning, then as you grow those companies, that's not going to be a bias. And that's a positive bias. But we want to make sure that that is what happens. And that is what is happening uh, in, uh, in point of fact. Thanks, Joanne. And I think that's an interesting point. You know, from our funds perspective, we do in, uh, work with partner funds that are both male and female that have this, we call it a bend to invest into diversity because they see it as a result and a return strategy. Uh, but to your point, you know, many people have asked us as well, is it that women tend to invest more in women because it's a bias, but, and the likelihood is that the network, the, the key here is not that we only choose women, right? But we most likely will have these networks through our communities, through people uh, that we work with and that we reach out to that result into this. So it's about how do we widen the funnel and not really narrow it? Well, we just don't want to have a negative bias. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. And with that, i um, happy to then bring in Lucy, who, first of all, I want to congratulate for closing a $160 million round uh, during the pandemic. So while all of us were grappling, she was closing a, a major deal, a Series D deal. And of course, you know, um, actually, I, th I think you earned the unicorn status even in the last round of funding. Is that right, Lucy? Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell us a little bit about your journey and um, your story about, you know, taking the bet on this business and, and why fintech? Um, so Airwallet sort of started five years ago um, by my co-founders and myself. Um, and over the past few years, we've really grown from a tiny little office in Melbourne now to globally 450 employees in 13 offices. And I think the fact that we've been able to gain the unicorn title in such a short time is evidence that you know fintech is a booming uh, industry as well as you know there's a lot of recognition in the capital market as well as from our um, customers that you know there is a real need um, for fintech in the current world that we live in because we're seeing you know connectivity we're seeing the world becoming more digitized and fintech is no longer just bringing offline financial services online, but it's also serving as an infrastructure and, and as a foundation for businesses to grow and expand globally. And yeah, so I think, you know, um, we really focused on uh, being a very product driven and tech driven company and hopefully, um, you know, bring our customers along that journey with us. Thanks, Lucy. And I know we talked a little bit about this, but for the benefit of those who don't know much about Air Wallets until today, uh, you did start as an FX solutions uh, provider, but now you're sort of going beyond that. Talk to us about what the opportunity um, has evolved into. I mean, you know, you started as I believe that coffee was the trigger uh, for which I think Jack saw an opportunity with one of the other co-founders in retail, if that's right, trying to bring over coffee from China into Australia with uh, Melbourne coffee being one of the best things uh, I, I've had a chance to experience. So definitely see the market demand there, but, you know, sort of struggling to then figure out how do we make this purchase in the most effective way. So talk to us about, you know, how that opportunity set has started from currency solutions to then uh, really the full stream of end to end. Yeah. So I think um, currency solutions is basically um, a sort of, the most basic uh, part of any cross-border um, trade and transaction. But we quickly realized, you know, very early on in, in, in building the product that you really need to consider the user cases and the experience. So it's no longer just about um, a currency exchange, but also, you know, in the business scenario, it's also about you know, the payment itself, right? Um, what is the underlying transaction? 
and what exactly do customers need when they are per, uh, sort of performing that transaction. So um, we realized that we need to have a very powerful um, connectivity to the global banking network to support that. And looking at uh, basically what the dem- where the demand is coming from is really in low value, high frequency transactions. So um, not your typical, you know, thousands of dollars or, you know, millions of dollars of settlement that is, you know, happening only once every quarter, every year, but your um, real time and um, basically the, the smaller amounts that really adds up because looking at the more traditional ways, the transaction fees are based on per transaction. So if you're charging, say, $25 or $50 per transaction, but the transaction itself is only $50, then your entire transaction has gone to the fees. So, um, yeah, so long story short, we started then to build into local payment networks because if you're looking at almost every uh, country now have some sort of real-time payment uh, uh, infrastructure and most likely to be very, very low cost. Um, so what happened was we connected into the local payment networks ourselves, um, you know, with the help of partners or by getting our own licenses in the respective markets. And we routed them, uh, we built also a payment route, uh, routing engine and our FX in combination with our FX engine, then we formed our own sort of uh, global banking network. And um, in conjunction to that, then we looked at what applications do we need, right? Um, so first of all, we need payout solutions. So we want people to be able to pay other people, um, you know, um, in other countries just as easily as they pay uh, domestically. And then uh, we looked at, you know, but that's only paying, right? What about receiving money? So then we built global accounts, which is a multi currency. Uh, account solution that allow people to collect in different currencies um, without actually going to the bank and opening the bank account themselves. And then this year we also launched uh, payment acceptance, uh, which is a gateway product for people to accept payment via cards and wallets, as well as uh, virtual card solutions, which allows people to uh, have a Visa card that's attached to uh, their wallet and they're able to make the payments. So it's a uh, really um, comprehensive um, product suite that we offer. And yeah, so hopefully that explains what we do. Thank you, Lucy. And and I know I'll pick on Liz uh, as the strategist here. I know she talks about thinking about the consumer and really your case study of evaluating, okay, what is the problem here? And really working through the entire stream of what a consumer needs and building all those capabilities is, is true to Liz, if you want to comment on sort of the evolving consumer needs before I jump to mock here. Uh, I would so appreciate your comments. I, I know you worked hard on sort of digital identity in India and fast payments in Australia and all these things as well. So would love, you know, a, a bit of your two cents here on, on just how fast the, the consumer need is, is evolving. Yeah, I mean, for me, it goes back to probably, you know, e-commerce and the evolution since PayPal, eBay, etc. Every consumer now wants to, you know, can sell the contents of their, their flat uh, or can buy whatever's on the internet. So everybody wants to be able to tra- trade and transact, not just locally, but online and, and to be able to also explore, you know, nowadays, whether you can buy financial products online, do everything digitally. And, and I think that the difference that that is driving in terms of the experience model um, the availability, the reach, the security, the certainty of who am I dealing with? You know, so as you mentioned digital identity. I think that's probably going to be one of the most groundbreaking things we can actually do as an industry is to assert who am I actually trying to transact with? In, in future, it's probably going to be more, is this a person I'm actually transacting with or is it a robot uh, or is it someone trying to scam me? And, and I think, um, you know, we underestimate probably the extent to which um, consumers all over the world want to be able to engage in that. Um, and, and as people get more access to mobile phones and, and we move to 5G and we move to quantum in the coming years, this is only getting more of a challenge and more and more complicated. Um, as, as Lucy alluded to, you know, cross-border is probably one of the most painful experiences that the majority of businesses and, and 
individuals still go through, even with all the fintech that we've introduced into this environment. And we don't realize it, how complex it really is. I mean, I've only dug into it recently and it's just, you know, to get the, we only think we, we key in, um, you know, our request and we get it in a couple of days and we complain about how long it takes still, right? <laughs> and, and how much it costs us, it, depending right. on, you know, whether you figured out the right way to do it. Uh, and, and I think it's only when you talk to people who have tried moving country or, or, you know, actually upping sticks and moving their entire family or doing something a little bit different, a little bit out of the ordinary, uh, or trying to export to another country, uh, something that you would think inherently was not actually that complicated. It's not like people have never done this before. Um, but there simply aren't the solutions quite often that are tailored for those experiences. And so, you know, a lot of this is down to uh, how do we uh, evolve innovative products that actually address those challenges that people are really genuinely going through on a day-to-day -day basis? And, and I think, you know, what I've seen over the last few years, we've seen a, you know, huge waves of migration of people all over the world from different segments of, of you know, whether it's Latin America, whether it's the Middle East, uh, you know, we, we see mass migrations and people quite often who, who have got access to fin finance and funds but have been dislocated or displaced. And you know, how do we help those people participate in the economy? How do we actually make access to, to things that are relevant for people's daily lives? And I, I think for me, this is one of the most powerful um, uh, parts to this initiative, you know, as you refer to bringing women and more diverse thinking into uh, what we're trying to achieve, is actually being much more relevant for the rest of the population. Typically, tech has been almost always designed for the top 2% or, the, or yeah. the digitally natives, the people who want to adopt the cool gadgets. I think at this point, we know that we have to engage with the rest of the community. We have to start uh, developing solutions that address the long tail. And, and that's probably as we go into things that are much more relevant and productive, where the, actually the longevity will sit and, and long-term profitability will lie. And Absolutely. I think women actually are quite often at the forefront of looking for those types of solutions because they're very pragmatic and very practical. Perfect segue there, Liz, to, for me to turn to Mark. Um, I, I know you've always had a bent uh, towards looking at you know, different uh, founders with different backgrounds, right? That unique backgrounds that they don't have to come from what, what we like to say, the cookie cutter expectation. Uh, Mark, you know, you invested in Lucy a, a while back and one, I think one of the early investors. And I did want to pick your brain here with regards to how you see uh, founders, you know, approaching sort of this time of crisis as well. How did you make a bet on Lucy and, and her other four founders? Um, and also maybe if you can comment, I mean, Liz picked up on, on this a little bit. So I'm, I'm giving you uh, Three, three questions in one. Uh, but the last part is, you know, from an Asia standpoint, right? Um, I, I think we've lagged a little bit, but we've seen definitely the rise in the last decade or so of e-commerce and, and just a lot of even uh, copycat models from the US that have worked that are now really taking the, you know, Southeast Asia to begin with by storm. You, you talk about um, like Tokopedia, you talk about um, Lazada and all that across Southeast Asia. Can you share a little bit about um, first the founders piece and then also uh, then the Asia piece? Mark. Yes, we invested in them. They were just an idea and a founding team of five. Uh, at an early stage, when we invest in a startup, we typically look at the team and we really like the Air Wallex team because of their relevant experience, the entrepreneur, as well as uh, diverse enough. Uh, so besides going after a big market, uh, in my opinion, uh, the reason why Air Wallet was successful was because they got the timing right. Uh, so if you can rewind the clock to, to five years ago, there were two major trends in Asia. Uh, so firstly, the rise of cross-border travel uh, that's fueled by budget airlines as well as outbound Chinese tourists. So that created a lot of needs for changing currencies. Uh, the second trend was actually the rise of global apps such as Uber. So five years ago, Uber was in countries like Russia, China, Southeast Asia. Uh, they generated all these micropayments for transportation that's with, that has to be settled uh, very cost effectively. So the old regime of you know, charging uh, for per transaction uh, for changing currencies uh, just doesn't work. Uh, so therefore, the Forex market was actually right for disruption and Air Wallex was there at the right time. Uh, in terms of uh, fintech in uh, Asia, uh, if you look at emerging Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, South Asia, West Asia, uh, we have about one third of the world's population, uh, but around two thirds of the world's unbanked population. 
And this unbanked population cannot be reached uh, by offline fiscal branches because they are just uh, too expensive. Uh, this is actually perfect for fintech, which is basically a very cost effective way of delivering financial services since the users just need to own a cheap smartphone. Uh, one of the most successful women co-founded fintech company in Southeast Asia that uh, I think we should be talking more about is Grab. Uh, it is actually co-founded by a Malaysian women entrepreneur, Tan Hui Ling. Uh, they started with right hailing, but today has morphed into a super app for all sorts of lifestyle services, from food delivery to cleaning services, uh, all paid through the app. Uh, it is rumored that Alibaba is trying to invest $3 billion into Grab, uh, making it a Decacon. Uh, so I believe, just like Lucy, we should see another woman co-founder, Unicorn, in our part of the world that should inspire more women to come forward and become entrepreneurs. Go on to Lucy then. Um, I know Lucy, you talked, you know, and, and Mock touched a little bit about this on how he definitely believes in underserved uh, and underserved founders and unique uh, founders that may not fit uh, the bill of what you think, you know, success looks like, right, in a very traditional view of what success is. And I know you've shied away a little bit from being identified as a woman co-founder, you know, you, I, and ultimately for us, we do believe it is about being uh, the best person for the job, but it is about widening the funnel to enable women and underrepresented uh, founders and funders to succeed. So talk to us here about um, your lessons, right? Because there are a lot of women founders across the world, and I, I know a couple of people actually from Pakistan as well, uh, joining in and, and are looking to grow as big as, as you have. How, how did you start from the big idea and how did you grow it and, and talk to us about your journey here in a male dominated industry still. Yeah, I think um, I never, like you said, I think I never really realized this, I wouldn't say issue, but um, until I was actually working on the, on the AirWallets. So I quickly realized a lot of people were asking me about, you know, gender related issues and they were asking me about, you know, how do I cope with being a room full of guys and, and I think that's just the reality of the tech world and the fintech world, right? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a much bigger problem than just women, women studying more businesses. We also probably need more girls studying, you know, software engineering and we need to actually be more open-minded about who what the actual tech founder would look like um, because traditionally people might think it's it's a, a software engineer who uh, been doing tech and interested in tech all his life and then, then he started the business because he he was interested in uh, solving a problem but you know it's a lot bigger than that. We, we actually see founders in tech who are not from tech background these days, and we see more women these days as well. So yeah, um, I think for me personally, the, the way I think about it is, it's not to take too much attention to it, but I also think I'm very lucky that my male co-founders and people who I work with fully respect um, having a, the diversity diversity in the room as well. So um, we have a lot of really great female leaders in Airwallex. And I think together we are probably role models for people who are coming into this industry as well. And um, I think, you know, what you said around, you know, the idea has to be, you know, very big. So it has to be a meaningful problem that you're solving and I think the industry the the bandwidth of the you know the the the, the actual um, demand has to be big enough so solving a little problem is great but um, to achieve something bigger you have to be very ambitious and um, plan for that um, you know bigger problem to be solved um, by having a very sustainable business model and thinking ahead and making sure everything you do is scalable. So that's sort of my lesson from the past five years. Great. Thanks, Lucy. And Joanne, you know, talking about the first and only, you've been really, as Shelley introduced you, the, the leader in the space and, and getting us to think 
art, about diversity, about the people we fund, about um, who we, we bring into our table, right? Into the decision-making table and ensuring that there's a diverse view here. Uh, maybe you want to share a little bit and, and pick a little bit, unpick a little bit of uh, what Lucy had talked about uh, and your own experience and how you see um, the funders that you fund making a difference. I think it's very important to, and, 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 I, and I, can, I want to say this about me personally, what we currently see in, in, in the venture capital business is not acceptable. And the only way that you can make a change in my own mind is that you have to be dedicated to expanding the opportunity set. And to do that, you have to take some risk and you have to step out and you just have to do it. Now that's male and female because we have um, uh, many men in this business that have been proactive as well. So it, it's nothing that we do by ourselves at all, but we've got to be proactive and we got to insist upon um, a change and growth. And so that is, uh, that is the Fairview story. And if you did not have a, a strong belief system, then nothing really changes. Uh, you're just, you just accept um, what we see before us right now. And it's not because anybody is trying to exclude you, um, but someone has to step in and say, well, I am going to be, not so much that I want to be included, I am going to be included. And that, of course, then expands the opportunity set. And so I think that's, um, that's really critical. So I, I look back at the, at the Fairview portfolio with respect to fintech in general. So we have 227 fintech companies. And, um, and in terms of just our investment uh, valuation, just in our portion of the investment, sort of about, uh, probably about a $200 million um, valuation. But what is really great is that those firms that we have invested in that have women um, founders or GPs, um, I think we have Chime, we have, uh, which is the, you know, challenging the, um, the, the banking segment, Ladder Financial Instant Life Insurance Premium Program, um, the um, uh, Socotra, which is a development of the cloud-based platform, uh, Cape Analytics um, cloud-based property data platform, uh, Sage um, Intact provider of accounting software. So all of these companies have been invested in, and started by women venture capitalists. Now they're not all uh, female um, owned and run, but I can I am I can say to you that in those companies you have female professionals. Uh, that are part of building those companies and female investors. And I think you will see more. And, and in this particular case, um, uh, accrued capital, uh, Lauren Kolodny, she was a founding partner of that, of that particular venture firm. Um, in Brewer Lane, you had the, uh, a, a, um, um, a managing partner, female. Um, at, J at Battery Ventures, a long-term venture fund, uh, 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 um, she is a general partner and responsible for those fintech companies. So it continues to expand, and I and I'm uh, and I think we should all be proud of that because that's good for everyone, and that's good for people who are looking for more capital, and for females that are in the venture business uh, as as GPs looking for great companies and looking at uh, the female founders. Who are who are building these companies? So that that's important. That's part of the Fairview story. Uh, and I think what also happens is that others then uh, begin to realize, and um, um, and I think that's important yeah. because then it, it it expands the opportunity set. And we're always looking to expand. And then someone said, and I think maybe it might have been uh, Lucy. Um, oh, Liz. I think Liz said it that you know females also have a different perspective uh we're looking at different aspects of of the fintech business uh, so that's part of it too and i'll say one last thing um and this is sort of um was well, fintech in a way in a way but uh in terms of of um of the what we're doing right now on zoom well mm -hmm. fairview is an investor in zoom uh, yeah. a big investor in zoom but we invested in a firm that was a first time fund. 
and now uh, and it's a very successful firm. So you have to keep looking and expanding the opportunity set. Uh, you look at the firms that have been in business a long time and continue to grow. Uh, they, they have competition as well. You have new firms coming in, but it never stops. It, it continues to grow. And I think that's the great story. Yeah. Uh, and the venture capital business is an entrepreneurial business. And so it has to continue to expand and grow all over the world, Thank which you, is Noah. what you're doing. Yep. And Mark, let's try one more time uh, with better sound, hopefully, but speak slowly. Um, I did want to sort of pick up a Joanne's point there on, uh, you know, that venture capital is an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial business in itself. Uh, the opportunities that will continue to grow and even during a time of crisis. And we talked a little bit about Black Swan events in your past interview that we did with you, Mark. Uh, talk to us a little, little bit about from, a, you know, from founders and funders, GPs that are working so hard right now to fundraise. Uh, you were, uh, you know, you joined Gobi Bray early on when you were not the 1.1 billion, um, you know, creature and, and uh, great, great, great uh, monster that you are, right? So talk to us a little bit about your view here on capitalizing on a crisis? Yeah, I think, uh, so first of all, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I think uh, my message has not changed uh, for founders during a crisis. I think crisis uh, for startups is actually an excellent time uh, because there's going to be opportunities uh, that arise from the crisis. But the first thing is you have to survive, right? So typically in a crisis, the first thing that happens is a liquidity crisis. There's going to be a shortage of funding. So for startups, I'll advise the first thing is you have to cut costs, right? You have to survive, right? And startups can do it much easier compared to bigger companies. Uh, once you survive, uh, what will happen is actually you'll see the disruptive opportunities that, that appear, right? So if you look at 2008, the global financial crisis, uh, consumers want to save money. They start to want to make more money doing side jobs. So what came out of the global financial crisis was basically the sharing economy. That's why you have startups like Airbnb, Uber, they actually came from that uh, global financial crisis. What is different with this uh, pandemic is, first of all, I think uh, we have gone anti-social, right? So think about consumption. Consumption has gone anti-social. If you look at the economy, we have definitely gone anti-sharing, right? Nobody wants to take right hailing anymore, right? But as a result of this sort of a change uh, due to the pandemic, you're starting to see new winners uh, in e-commerce, food delivery, logistics, use vehicle marketplace. I think in the US, there's actually been a one year waiting list for swimming pools to be installed at the houses, right? So I think there's new opportunities there. You just need to realize what they are and capitalize on them after that. Perfect, thank you. And we will now start our Q&A and the first question has come in. What has been the most surprising thing you've learned as a founder or funder watching women innovate? So maybe you wanna start with Liz? In sort of uh, the M&A work and partnerships and all that. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I think it, when I look back, you know, we help hundreds of companies every year, uh, specifically through StartPath. I think what I uh, really have seen is the rise of women coming through. So, you know, now we've got to a point where I think about 30% uh, of the founders uh, within that group of, of those companies are, are female. Um, I, I think that's something that we wouldn't have predicted necessarily a few years ago when we started out down this path. Um, but I think also just the fact that uh, the solutions are coming, that are coming out are much more practical. Uh, there's less kind of uh, things that people are dreaming about fixing in, in kind of a couple of years time or these, these kind of hockey stick trajectories. It has to be much more down to earth, which is I think what Mock was referring to earlier. Find those opportunities that are real and tangible in front of you. And that I think for me is, is what's coming out right now. Thank you. And second question, panelists, you see it on your screen. Do you have any advice for first-time founders looking to grow in the fintech space? What key aspects set founders apart when seeking funding? So, Mock, I think this is created for you from Tiffany Atkinson. Thank you, Tiffany. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, for first-time founders looking to grow in the fintech space, uh, fintech space is a very interesting space, right? It's easy to lend out money, uh, but a lot of times if you're not careful in lending out money, you actually cannot collect back. So I think for first-time founders uh, looking in this kind of space, technology is critical. So whether you are doing lending, you need a good you know, credit profile engine. If you are doing payment, you need a very efficient, low-cost transaction engine. So I think technology is actually key. 
Great. And Lucy, do you want to pick on that too? As a first time founder, I mean, you, I think you had a background uh, in finance a little bit, but you came in from corporate, right? With Hong Stone and all that. Talk to us about how you, um, you would advise a first time founder. Um, I would say you are the expert of what you do. So, you know, you wouldn't expect a VC to know more about your business than yourself. So really, um, a lot of times, um, don't be scared by the process itself. Um, especially, I guess, you know, you know, end round or early rounds, you, you might be, you know, a little bit intimidated by fundraising, but really to go back to, you know, why do you need the money? What do you need the money for? And what sets people apart? I think, well, might agree with me or not, but I, I still think in the very early stages, it's, a, it's about the team. And it's about, you know, whether you are the winner in that industry or have the potential to be the winner in that industry. So, yeah, um, be very confident about um, what you're doing. I like that. I like that. I, I think a lot of times we, we, we have a lot of self-doubt. Uh, so your first line there is definitely a notable quotable that you are the expert in what you want to do. Uh, and Joanne, I did want to turn to you because you specialize in emerging funders. Um, you know, a lot of folks on here, I, I see a couple of funds that I, I recognize that are pre-Fund 3. And as we know, uh, for those of you joining who, who don't know, uh, Fund 1, Fund 2, Fund 3 of a venture capital fund's life, they're still considered emerging managers uh, and therefore struggle with track record and building the track record and credibility that will uh, convince an institutional, typically LP, so a limited partner investor that invests into these funds to back them. Uh, so Joanne, your comments here, please. Well, I, I think one thing you need to do your research and look at those firms and funds that are that are investing in fintech. I think that's very important. Uh, look at the track record they are developing in that area. Look at the people who are doing the investing. Uh, look at the companies that are in the portfolio. I think all of that should be a part of it. And then be used to hearing no. Uh, it's a tough business. And so you're going to get more no's and yeses. So you have to have... Um, uh, you have, it, it, this, it's a business where you are just looking for one yes, uh, and it's uh, a bunch of no's. When we were raising Fairview, I mean, you know, if I could just begin to even tell you how many no's we received as we got that first yes. So I think that's also very important. Um, and then I think also in, in, as you're marketing your, your company, everybody has different gifts and talents. And so you have to get those people who not only have uh, uh, the knowledge, but also are the best people in selling uh, your company and your brand and what it is you're trying to do. Uh, and I think that's also um, very critical. Um, so I, I think when you see clean tech, uh, not clean tech, I'm sorry, uh, FinTech um, growing in, in um, popularity around the country and the world, uh, you just have to, but you need to do your homework and you need to know exactly um, what you're trying to do and make sure you, uh, there's an economy uh, in terms of your, your efforts because you've done some good research. Thank you. And Joanne, this is an, another quick one from you from Simon Gillett. Do LPs like yours, a fund of fun, expect an ESG statement that promotes diversity and that ex promotes diversity and inclusion? So maybe you can speak a little bit about this from an ESG standpoint. So we, we do not require an ESG statement uh, and the truth of the matter is Fairview, uh, we want, uh, and the funds, I'm, you know, and of course I'm in the fund side of the business, but we're interested in, in understanding and seeing what you're doing. We want to meet you. We want to get to know you. We want to see you build. We even want to be able to share information where they know it will be confidential uh, so that we see more people in the business because um, for founders uh, who are building companies, you want to have a lot of options and you want to be able to, to go to organizations and funds that are doing some of the work um, that we're talking about today. So when we're talking about FinTech, um, and, I, and I guess we all know 10 years ago, there probably were not that many FinTech companies. Um, 10 years later, there are a lot of FinTech companies. So we want to make sure that founders are prepared uh, to enter into the, uh, the institutional marketplace. Great, thanks. And last one from Eli Elisha, and I think she's from Malaysia. So welcome, Elisha. Uh, for maybe for Lucy and Mock, 
uh, what are the hard skills that we should have and think about, especially I think in this time of a crisis, right? There's a lot of talk about jobs being removed and, and new jobs being created. So talk to us a little bit about upskilling here. That'll be helpful, thanks. Uh, so maybe I can take a step first. I think so. So first of all, um, you know, obviously you need a, uh, I'll say the technical uh, skill set, but because a lot of these uh, applications are consumer focused, I do think what is important, especially in uh, Southeast Asia, is actually product management skills. So the ability to actually distill and figure out, you know, what are the features that you need in the product. Lucy, upskilling. Upskilling. Um, I think. I think more and more, like we well, especially when we're hiring people, we see that you know, just raw intelligence is probably one of the most important things that a person can work on and have. Um, it's because everything we do is so new, right? Like it's very hard to say your previous experience or something that you learn from the book or from um, any sort of. Uh, way can be applied for future um, reference, right? So I think um, skills to have is not necessarily hard skills, but I would say more around critical thinking and problem solving. Great, thank you. And last one, and then we'll wrap with a quick fire, uh, quick lightning round. Uh, this I think for Mark and Lucy and, and maybe Liz as well from, from your uh, work in India and all that. As mentioned previously, there's been a rise in copycat models in the US that have worked in Asia. Do you have any advice for fintech companies in Asia to move beyond this sort of model? Great question, Maxine, thank you. Mark? Okay, so maybe from my perspective, uh, we do see that the next decade, a lot of innovation happen on the supply side. Uh, on the supply side, uh, I think there's no good models that you can copy from the West. So I do think that a lot of models uh, that will be created on the supply side will actually be originals that we actually create for markets specific to Southeast Asia or other parts of Asia. Liz, any comments there on fintechs being more creative? So, yes, I remember being in Singapore, actually, when Grab took off and it was an amazing journey and it's a fantastic thing to see. Uh, you know, the difference then when you move to another market, the other side of the world is quite dramatic, uh, partly just because the way of people live. And, and so th these things don't necessarily transport very easily from one to the other. So you do have to do your research. Um, I, I was going to also add maybe to the previous question, communication. So being able to explain to people the why you're doing what you're doing and what it actually means and what it's, what's the difference between what you're doing and what everyone else is doing. Um, I, I find communication skills, uh, and, and when you move to another market, bringing that communication or ability to actually explain why this is relevant in this particular region is critically important. And listen, find out why is it important. Thank you. And with that, 30 seconds around this uh, lightning round, starting with Joanne. Uh, message to everyone on the line who's listening here to create a more inclusive future powered by fintech. Joanne? Well, I think uh, the, the fintech arena is, is sort of a, it tells its own story because it's allowed us to communicate uh, with each other more effectively and all over the world. So uh, it's exciting in, in every way. And it takes out some of the people that have gotten in the way of success, uh, by the way. So that's the other very positive aspect of FinTech. And then I think we have to be creative, um, open, be willing to uh, explore, and, uh, and then continue to be risk takers. And I think that um, that's a recipe for success. Lucy? Um, I think think of FinTech as not only a tool or application, but it's more um, a, an infrastructure that will uh, fill and uh, help businesses grow in the future. And I actually read somewhere that it's, it's the fourth platform. So after cloud, mobile, and got the other one. But um, it is um, a very powerful tool that will enable a lot of people to monetize and uh, I guess achieve their own uh, ambitions in different fields. Thank you, Mark. Message to everyone on the line on building an inclusive future powered by FinTech. Yeah, I think, uh, so first of all, I think we are living in an age where politics is pull, pulling the world apart. Uh, and I think the hardest thing that's happening right now is actually a K-shaped recovery, which actually is bad because a K-shaped recovery means that the rich gets richer because of asset inflation, right? And the poor gets poorer because of uh, wage deflation. 
so I, I really think that the only forces, uh, which is finance and technology, those are the forces that can equalize such inequalities. So I think for us in this sector, whether you're doing a finance job, you're doing a technology job, we should try to do our part and bring humanity together. Thank you, perfect. Liz? Uh, for me, it's to be bold, uh, actually tackle more complex challenges. So referring back to what Lucy uh, said earlier, pick those really complex things that actually apply to beyond the one or 2%. Fix the things that everybody's been trying to ignore for a while, fix the things that will improve all of our lives. And I think bringing diversity of input from all segments of society into your thinking and applying things that will actually be relevant for everybody is more likely to achieve success and, and foster that inclusion. Perfect. Thank you, Liz, for bringing us home here. And what a powerful discussion. I know it's a lot to cover in literally just under an hour, but we've touched upon, you know, some of the, the key trends from open banking to really creating a, a, a customer focused solution to then touching about Asia and the different regions of the world and, and how you can continue to build an inclusive future powered by fintech. And with that, from Washington, D.C., over to Washington, D.C., over to you, Shelley. Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody on the panel. I think we, if we could give everybody a, a, a round of applause, a round of applause. <laughs> um, uh, really appreciate all these fantastic insights. We have a lot to absorb here. With a second or two I have left here, I want to make sure to recognize this is the third of the uh, Billion Dollar Bytes series um, uh, sponsored by MasterCard. And I want to give a particular shout out to Ann Carrots, who I know is on the line here, who is the most extraordinary supporter of us and of so many women, so many, um, so many other initiatives. She's the chair of the Financial Alliance for Women. She's the chair of the 30% Club, which is about women getting on boards. And it's, it's champions like her, like Joanne, and like others of you on, on not only here on our panel, but in our audience. We know some of you in the audience who have really allowed us all. It does take a village. It takes leadership. And we are the leaders. Prince Charming is not coming. So on that very note, I will just end and say thank you all for joining us. Please look out in the fall for one of our newest initiatives, which will be an LPGP Engage program, where we'll provide opportunities for GPs to engage one-on-one -on -one with uh, LPs uh, that are new in their networks in order to expand the networks that we know are so critical to the future success of both founders and funders. Thank you all so very much, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you.